Last week I taught on bearing fruit from rest, which is, um, um, if you didn't see, if you weren't here last week, please go on Facebook or on Vimeo or on uh, um, ATC, Torchbearers ATC, it's all, they're all there, so um, that you can see it because it's really important. So this morning I want to talk about um, the secret place prayers that avail much. And it's great to say you you know, bear fruit from rest, but what does rest look like? And so when we say rest, you know, um, a lot of people don't know the simplicity of God. And is there work to do in the kingdom? Absolutely. Um, there, you know, if you spend enough time in rest, he's going to give you work to do. That's just just the way it is. And um, a lot of times we we spend more time fretting over the what to do than spending time with the who we're doing it for. And the kingdom doesn't work like the world. You don't get paid for hourly wages in the kingdom. Matter of fact, you don't want to get paid hourly. You get paid by inheritance, which is a lot better. It's a lot more rewarding than, you know, well, I can only do an hour. You know, if God knows your time frame, he knows your schedule, um, does he require us to shift things in our life? Absolutely. I mean, when I got saved, you know, before I got saved, my priority was not God. Before you got saved, the priority was you. So let's be honest. Some of you have been saved too long. You don't remember that. Been saved 60 years. Okay, well, you don't remember that. And you were a little kid and you've been living for Jesus for six years. Okay, the rest of us weren't. And we can remember when we were serving ourselves. It didn't look, we didn't think we were serving ourselves. And the problem is, is too many people are looking out for number one, they step in number two. And, and, and that you really have to understand how the kingdom works. And this kingdom is so bizarre for most people because it's too simple. It's just too simple. It should be harder than this. We make it harder. Religion likes to make it hard because religion likes to pat itself on the back and say, see how hard I work. It likes to, it likes to actually, it doesn't mean you don't have a lot of work to do um, in the kingdom. I mean, you know, like Bill's traveling 180 days out of the year. You know, Jesus culture with banning, he talks, you know, I talk to him, he's like, yeah, I'm busy all the time. You know, but it all comes from a place of rest, which is really bizarre. <laughs> you know, um, an oak tree doesn't struggle to grow. It knows how to grow. We, we sometimes don't know how God can bring increase if we don't work harder. Because we actually think if we work harder, we bring increase. And in the world, that works. Now, if you're lazy, let's just assume no one's lazy. Now, if you're lazy, slothfulness is spoken about. We're not talking about that. We're, we're, let's assume we all want to work. Let's assume we're all Christians, so we'll just assume some things. It's like someone asked Bill Johnson one time, why don't you teach on tithing a lot? He says, I just assumed everyone was Christian. It's what Christians do. It's in the book. It's like we shouldn't have to sit there and like struggle for these things because it's in the book. Let's just assume that, let's assume things. Let's assume we're born again. We want to bring the kingdom. We want to see the kingdom increase in us. And we want to see it increase outside of us. And so a lot of times, the way we think we bring increase is the way the world world brings increase. And the way the world brings increase is by getting their name everywhere, up on everything. Um, From the earliest ages now, you have, baseball players and football players trying to develop their their brand. It starts in, in high school to college now where the kids are all thinking, if, they're, if they can see that they're going to make it to the pros, they're already working on their brand. Before they ever get out of college, they've already got a brand. Everyone knows who they are as soon as they hit the NFL. They've already got 100,000 Twitter followers. Right? They already got... 
people tracking them. They're, they're, they know they're going to get endorsements. And that's how, how does Nike get out there? Branding itself. It puts itself everywhere. But how does God do it? And that's, that's, the, that's the interesting thing. <clears throat> if, if Jesus wanted to do it according to the world, he put his logo everywhere. You don't bring increase by the, in the kingdom by putting crosses up everywhere. And so we've got to see how the kingdom brings about increase. Does it mean we preach? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, you can preach the gospel and not have success. How many people want to have success in what you do? And so there's just a couple ways um, that we can unfold in Scripture to do it. So let's start off with, I want to read you this Scripture first, but Psalm 110 verse 3 says this, Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. Now, the secret place is the womb where you are formed and fashioned for the kingdom. When you're beholding them in the beauty of holiness. When you're spending time with him in the secret place. More will happen outside the more you allow to happen inside. There are a lot of ministries that are big. But they might not have everlasting fruit. Because the way they have built it is off of marketing, but they haven't really fashioned the kingdom. In other words, I, you can go to places. There's, there's a place, I'm not gonna, they're not in this town, so I'll use other places, but they have a 25,000-member church, and they don't play any music because they don't want to offend anybody. And it's 25,000 members. When they wanted to show, someone who served there wanted to show a one of the Holy Ghost films from Darren Wilson, they told, no, that's not one of the allowable films. Some of the allowable films are the Disney Pixar movies. But they're 25,000 members strong. See, that isn't necessarily signs of fruit of the kingdom. And we get confused by that. How many people know that we, we get confused by that? And God looks at things completely different than we do. And he lets them both grow. He says, I let them both grow in the kingdom until the age. And then I pull up the tares. So that's why Paul says, don't judge anything before it's time. Because he doesn't judge everything until the last day. Now, can, those, can that place have revival? Yeah, God can do anything. Can it actually have a revolution, a revelation, uh, a, a pres- the presence of God come in and change everything? Absolutely. Okay? Is it likely? Well, it doesn't look like it's likely because there's no room for it. I mean, if you can't even allow worship in the place, that's a problem. So, so the point is, is how do we bear fruit for the king? Because that's what we talked about last time, was, was bearing fruit from rest. And so you have to know what, what rest looks like hmm. versus what, what the world looks like. It's not how much you pray. Like when I say how much you pray, how much you ask for, how much you talk. Okay, so turn to Matthew chapter 6. We'll use the words of Jesus. We'll use the words of Jesus to help us. Talk about this a little bit, since so no one can argue with it. Well, I guess people can. I have found people can argue with Jesus, which is really stunning. He's my Lord, but I disagree with him. Okay, good luck with that. He says this, verse 6, Matthew 6, But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to the Father who is in secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So let me tell you this. If you'll shut your door, he'll open his. If you learn to shut your door, he'll open his door. He's the one who opens doors no man can close and shuts doors no man can open. If you'll shut your door with him, he will open his. And it's really important to 
to understand that if you want to have breakthrough in your life, just spend some time with them. How much time? I don't know. Why don't you start with five minutes? Why don't you just grab, I tell people, just grab Proverbs or something. Grab, just start reading until it hits you. Until like, well, that's an interesting saying. And then go, oh God, that's pretty interesting. And meditate on it. Just think about it. <clears throat> it's the simplest way, yet it's the most least used approach by Christians because we don't like simple. We want to show, look at maturity in the kingdom is not telling God, look, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> That's not maturity. Maturity of the kingdom is when you actually come to a place of total reliance upon him. And uh, last Saturday, Sunday night, uh, went home. Kathy and I, just, we watched Brian Johnson's video from, I think it was last Sunday. On May, uh, it was May 8th, Sunday night. You can watch on Bethel TV. And he's, he's talking about his nervous, he had a nervous breakdown last July. And uh, he goes, for no reason. He said, everything's going well. The label's doing well. The church is doing well. The ministry's doing well. Things are going well. And all of a sudden, he's out with his son. He realizes something's wrong. And before he knows it, within a day, he's, he's that night, the ambulances are coming because he's having a nervous breakdown. And the only way he could get out of it was to go back to the simplicity of just spending time with God, reading his word. He said, you know how you think you're trusting God? Now, look it. This is the thing, this is the trappings of success. As you start working what God gives you instead of doing what you've always done. Is there responsibilities? Yeah, there's a ton of responsibilities the more God gives you. But there's still the one responsibility, and that's to spend time with God. Not that he wasn't. He said, not that I was spending time in the world. I just, he said, I learned what it meant to totally rely on God. He says, you know, you know we all think we are until we find out we're not. And he said, if you really love God and you really trusted him, you would actually pray for that scenario to happen in your life. You would actually pray for God to strip you of all your false pretenses and all the things that you think you know so well and how you keep yourself together and realize you're only together because he says so. You're only, who, you're only holding it together because he's got grace on your life. And if you get to a point where you don't realize that, then God just lifts it a little bit and you'll see how much you do without grace. Not because he's mad, but because he loves you. Wasn't, he wasn't angry. Actually, I tell people this all the time. They don't believe me. <laughs> but when you actually get stripped of everything, you realize how much God really loves you. He does it because he loves you, not because he doesn't. God doesn't strip you of everything. He doesn't do it to everybody. Why? Because not everybody has found that much favor. See, when you really find favor with God, he'll take you to a place that he won't take everybody. And too many people are afraid of that place, thinking that that place is a sign of God's disfavor. But it's actually the process for promotion. I had given Brian a word. I emailed him a word in February that there was a promotion coming in his life. And that now he was going to become a father of worship leaders. And he was going to be like a wheel inside the wheel of the Bethel movement. Four months later, he goes through that. And he goes, I just I realized it was a promotion. That's what happens. It is the pro I mean, I was praying for him because Brian had said last year, a year and a half, about six months prior to that, he felt his words weren't relevant anymore to the next generation. And I started praying for him. I said, wait a minute. It's a good place when you realize that your words were never relevant without God. Like we really have to realize it's God who brings increase in our life. Paul, Paul's great revelation was the fact that God was the one who brought the increase. You want increase in your life. It's not because you pray prayers of boldness. <laughs> you like to believe that. Well, if I just learned the right way. Like, I heard Bill pray and say it this way, and Bill was had his right hand, and, and he had this look on his face when he did it. And if I just... If I get that just right, 
if I could just do it right, then I'll get the breakthrough. And, and Bill will tell you none of his breakthroughs ever came from him doing it right. In Abraham, it says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Uh, Genesis 15, 6, I think it is, somewhere in there. That word believe means to take the right-hand road that leads you to the right side, that leads you to the right hand of God where you're standing next to him. That's what belief means in Hebrew. Belief doesn't mean, oh yeah, I acknowledge that truth to be true. It means when you believe God, it actually positions you next to God. Okay, you didn't get that. They got it over here. You all look at me like a cow at a new gate. When you believe God, when you truly believe God, it positions you at his right hand, which is where breakthrough comes through. It's not getting God to come to you. Because God already came to you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's already came to you. You have to go to him. And when you go into your secret place and shut the door, it's just you and him. And if you have to actually find a place where you have to shut the door, then do it. If you have to get up, for Brian, he said it meant getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning again. He said, yep, yeah, I lost some sleep, but it was worth it. He said it's daily for him now. In other words, if he doesn't do it daily, he still has a, he'll have a nervous breakdown again. He's like totally dependent upon God every day of his life. And we would say, well, that's just crazy. No, that is humility. That is glory. That is the power of God. When he strips you of all your human ability and makes you totally reliant upon him to move and live and have your being. He doesn't do that for everybody. See, I see that and I go, oh God, thank you for healing him. I say, oh God, I'm jealous. I know that. I've, I've been down that road. It is a really exciting season. You didn't know he was going through it. It didn't come out in his worship. It didn't come out in his public appearances. I'm, you know what I love about having wisdom is you don't talk about it until you're on the other side. He didn't get up in a pulpit and cry about it and complain about it. He understood that his job in, whenever he's in front of people is to represent God. But that night, his dad came over, Chris came over, and they all started praying for him. But it's actually a glorious thing. It just doesn't feel like glory when you're going through it. See, there's something really awesome about realizing you're nothing without Christ. I mean, we know it. We say it. But we don't really believe it. Why? Well, how many times do we do things without actually relying upon him to get them done? See, see I put this out yesterday, you know. The cross didn't change the Father. It was meant to change us. God hasn't changed his position on sin. He hasn't changed his position on holiness. And he certainly knows he's still God. He hasn't changed at all from the cross. Why he changes not? People think, well, God, God looks differently at sin now. God does not look differently at sin. God rewards us openly when we spend time with him in secret. Psalm 91, 11, uh, 91 1, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 27, 5, for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Now, this is what you have to understand about how God hides you. God doesn't hide you from the enemy. He takes you out of reach of the enemy. <clears throat> In other words, he'll set me high upon his rock. Well, he's the rock. He sets me unhigh. Where? I'm seated with him in heavenly places. 
He sets me up on high and the enemy can't touch me when I'm with him. You know, Jesus said, no one takes my life. Satan couldn't really kill Jesus unless Jesus allowed him to kill him. And if the Father didn't give the authority, Jesus says, don't you know I could ask my Father right now for 12 legions of angels and he would send them? But no, it was the will of the Father for die. Yeah, but Jesus still knew who he was. He had surrendered his will. Jesus had to go through the same thing we go through. What do you think Jesus was feeling in the garden? He just, Jesus, Jesus, the blessing of watching Jesus is he, he compressed a process into an hour that might take us a month. You know, he, he travailed for an hour or two in the garden, what might take us like a year to go through the process because God's gracious for us. It was so intense, he's sweating blood, which is a condition that when you're under such stress and such pressure, your capillaries actually open up and blood comes out through your pores. It's actually a medical condition. It's under extreme, extreme conditions. So it tells you what he was going through in prayer. It wasn't like he was like, oh, this is wonderful. Psalm 3120, you shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of men. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. There's something about life you have to understand, and this is where I can, uh, you know, I really like to teach people that your criticism is actually fiery darts in the devil's hands. And that when you're critical of things and of saints and of ministers, and can you imagine what, I mean, I, I was, I'm reading Banning's book, and he talks about, you know, when we were nothing, it didn't matter much. He says, now we release an album, and you get stuff like, oh, they've sold out. They're sellouts. Is this all you got? I can't believe you put this thing out. Like, people, it's amazing to me how saints think that it's godly to go on there. We call, in, the, in the media, they call them trolls. Where do trolls live? <laughs> and all, uh, They're the underground nutcases who think it's their job to criticize everything. But they don't actually realize that they're going to give an account for those words before the Father. And by the way, I do question whether or not they're going to make it. Because I really wonder how close they really are when all they are is critical to, to God's saints. It's not easy being doing, doing some things. You could disagree with doctrine, but... Just some of the things you, you hear is like, you know, or as Bill Johnson put it one time, I just, I just exercised my second favorite fe uh, feature on Facebook, which is blocking someone. I forget what my first favorite one is. You know, and they, they have to do that a lot. You have to just block people. And I do a periscope, and I have people on there, thinking, and I just go, block, sorry. I don't have time for you. I'm not here to argue with you. You're just a troll. Jesus didn't spend his time with those. You notice he didn't spend a lot of time with those who didn't really want to listen. Sounds stunning, but he's the Savior of the world, yeah. He's also Lord. You know. So God wants to put you in a secret place. Song, uh, Song of Songs 2.14 says, Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret place of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Where did we see that before? Is there a scripture that talks about the cleft of the rock? Moses, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. And I'll put my hand over you. And when I pass by, I'll remove my hand and you can see my backside. The cleft is the side of Jesus. He's the rock with a cleft. The Father puts his hand over it. Hides us in Christ. If you, if you understand that, it's not what you pray in the secret place as much as is you spending time with him in the secret place. You're not heard for your many words. You know that God already knows. Now, one thing you could pray is like, oh God, whatever you have to do in me, do it. Now, don't do it if you don't mean it. No, do it anyways. Go ahead. God really doesn't care if you mean it or not. Just do it. Just give him permission. Just go say, God, just, just get me. And then all of a sudden you realize, <clears throat> wow, why, is, why am I feeling, 
why, why do I feel like agitated or why do I feel nervous about things? I didn't feel nervous before I started, but this is why people pull out of the secret place because they actually think it's demonic. And what God is showing you and trying to teach you is, number one, you can have the secret place wherever you're at. <clears throat> He's trying to get you to rely on him more than once a week. To pray without ceasing. To always stay in the secret place. That's why you have a mobile temple. Goes where you go. I, I mean, Jordan talked about making a t-shirt that said, who's living in your temple? Good question, isn't it? Have all the scriptures that deal with your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. Who's living in your temple? Have you checked it out lately to make sure it's just God? <laughs> See if there's any varmints in there. Got some squatters. <laughs> Anyone else taking up residence? Maybe the wisdom of men are taking up residence. Maybe the religious protocols of the church has taken up residence in your temple. Start thinking you don't have you you don't have the right to spend time with God because you're not an ordained minister. Or God looks at you differently because you're not an ordained you are, are some of the religious BS of the church keeping you from going up forward all the way up into, through the veil, all the way up to him because you don't think you're worthy because the church says you're not or because the church has made God distant when God is very near. Maybe maybe because you go to a place that treats God as he only comes down when you sing the right song. I mean, all these things that create the, uh, uh, the barriers to true worship and true fellowship with God that you think you actually have to, like, plead with God to fellowship with you? When it's him who wants to? When it's him who desires to? We actually make it seem like he doesn't want to? I mean, why do you think the, what do you think the cross did? His, oh, by the way, in the Old Testament, New Testament, he kept on saying, I'll be, I'll be with my people. I'll dwell amongst them. Why, why is it we struggle with that? It's easy because we got raised up in church. Church is a very bad place to get raised up in. Because church teaches the things of men more than the things of God. And that creates a, that creates a really, really bad problem in us. That we actually... Um, get hung up and get get blockage to how much he actually wants to spend time with you. And you could spend time with God anywhere. He does want the quiet, secret place times, but the secret place is shutting the door. It's, for a Jewish person, it was falling on your knees, taking your prayer shawl, throwing it over your face, and covering yourself in it and praying in secret. It's, it's just when you, and it's just you and God. And it, it requires effort. That's why it says the labor to enter his rest. It requires effort because you have to, you, you can't get in there effortless, effortlessly. You have to make the decision, I'm, I'm going to spend time with God. <clears throat> but it's, it's, it's difficult for, for people a lot of times because Religion has so blocked the simplicity of fellowship with the Holy Spirit to the point where it's almost like, well, you know, then, then you get to really, I, I love the ones who go, well, you know, you really got to be careful. You know, they're getting into like, you know, like the whole idea of mystics, people take it to such an extreme, Right? that they screw it all up. They make it goofy. Do you not think it's mystic to spend time with the Holy Spirit and pray? That's, but we have to make it, it like, 
It's supposed to be a mystery outside the church. It's not supposed to be a mystery inside. When we make it a mystery to even those who are in the church and pray a lot, then like God, there's, there is, look, there are some people that are whacked out. I get it. I get it. They just are. They, they just try to make it all the stuff that you can't, there's no way to grade it. There's no way to say, is that extra, is that really in the scriptures? Is that really the kingdom? Right? Because, you know, like if most prophetic people's words were actually tracked to see if they came to pass, it would kill half the prophets in the kingdom. Like some of your words should at least come to pass. That would just, you know, it's not, it's not you know, well, I prophesied to somebody one time and, well, that's awesome. You got one out of a thousand. It's awesome. I mean, we're keep going, but probably not a prophet. We got we to gotta get back to the simplicity of the kingdom. He says to seek the kingdom first. What does that mean? What, what does that mean to people? For me, it meant first to seek. No more. It's impossible to seek the kingdom without seeking the king. Which is seeking the kingdom, by the way. Where's the kingdom? It's in the king. Why? Why don't you think it's in Jesus when Jesus says the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation, but it comes from within you? Why do you not think he's telling you, hey, here's the kingdom. It's in me. I give it to you. So when I seek the king, I seek the king. And Paul says the gospel of the kingdom he didn't, was not taught by man, nor did he receive it by man, but he received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, when he saw Jesus and got the revelation of Jesus, he saw the kingdom. So when I go in the secret place, I'm seeking the king, seeking the kingdom, and he gives me revelation. It's really easy. People go, how do you get revelation? I go, how do you not? That's literally, it's so simple for me. I know it's God. Now, look, I know it's Randy, Randy Lester said to me one time, you get frustrated because people don't get it. I go, I do. And he goes, but you get it by the Spirit. I go, I know. And he goes, what's the problem? We all have the same Spirit. That's what frustrates me. I don't think I'm special. So if God's willing to share stuff with me, I believe he's willing to share stuff with everybody. I believe my job is not to give you all the revelation God gives me necessarily. I do do that. But my job is to equip you so you learn how to get your own revelation. So you have your own relationship. So you have your own responsibility. So you have your own time with God. Not so I, you could just go, boy, can't wait till the pastor gives me another message. Like, What good is the revelation I've given you if you don't apply it anyways? Just makes us proud. Knowledge just puffs us up. Revelation <laughs> requires us to steward it, which means it requires us to do something. I cannot, once God reveals something to me about himself, I can never go back to the old way. I can't worry about my health or my finances or my life or anything when he says, do not worry. Now, that is a commandment, but that's not a revelation. The revelation is, you are my heavenly father, and you will always take care of me. And once he told me that and revealed that to me, I have to cease from operating any other way. Why? Because then I didn't steward the revelation. Does that mean at times that spirit of fears don't come and try to? Sure they do. And then you know it's a fear. Why? You know it's not God. Why? Because God who told me do not worry does not bring fear. Right? That's how you, steward, that's how you begin to steward revelation. You say no to other spirits. Because there are other spirits, you know. There's not just one. That's why there's only, the reason he's the Holy Spirit is because he's holy. There's a revelation right there. Well, God doesn't care about holiness. Oh, no, he does. Huh, huh. Without holiness, nobody will see God. 
So he came to make you holy. Aren't you glad? Now, you can't make yourself holy. You can help sanctify. Okay? Once he's sanctified, you don't unsanctify yourself. He can help sanctify, but he makes holy through resting on you. One of my favorites. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's start at verse 1 just because I like Paul. It is doubtless it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in a body I do not know, whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. How he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is unlawful for a man to utter. Number one, if you want deep revelation, you have to learn to shut your mouth. Okay. A lot of people want, look at, a lot of people want an encounter so they can put it on Facebook. I was going to be honest with you. They want something that they're going to be able to talk about. People are able to look at them. I mean, awesome. So you have part of the part of the responsibility of revelation is not everything that God reveals to you can be expressed on earth. Now you get to ask them which one it is, but I I've, I, I try to tell people a lot of times they'll get caught up in a vision they'll come to me. What do you think it means? I said, go back to the dark room. Why are you coming to me? Like you were right there. Like. There is a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation, Paul prayed, right? There's also a spirit of understanding. Those are three different spirits. One of them revealed something to you. There's a spirit of understanding that you see Daniel keeps going. And I turned to the one who stood by and said, what do these things mean? That was an angel called understanding. <clears throat> I'll get into that. They'll get really freaky to some people. Like, look at me. Spirits are angels. Okay. Oh, let's not talk to angels. Well, when you pray, God, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation, you're praying for angelic activity. Aren't angels ministering spirits who are sent forth? Don't worship them. Just don't ignore them. Oh, no, we don't want to talk about angels. That's too scary. This whole thing is scary. That's why he keeps telling us to fear not. <laughs> everyone I know on this, everyone I've read about fell down and, and were shaking, and we think, oh, it's not supposed to be scary. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The fear of the Lord would do, do us some good. It's the first spirit you need to navigate through the kingdom. You can't have wisdom without the fear of the Lord. You want wisdom? Welcome the angel of fear of the Lord. Yeah, this is a good time to be afraid. Okay, good, thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> oh, such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth, but I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger. This is not sickness, it's a messenger. I wish people would just read this. Oh, the thorn in the flesh was sickness. No, it was a messenger. It was not illness. It was a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning things I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Now, the messenger was sent, was given to him from the Lord, was allowed. The Lord allowed this in his life. But listen, it's not to bother Paul. It's only to bother Paul when Paul is in a realm he's not supposed to be in. 
I'm going to explain that <laughs> so you can understand that. It's only there for when Paul is operating in the wrong place that it requires him to go to a different place to get away from him. Concerning the things, I plead with the Lord three times that he might depart from me. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather in my, boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In other words, Paul, when you are <clears throat> living in your revelations, but not living in my grace, this messenger will buffet you so that you don't think it's by your revelations you can do stuff. In other words, knowledge puffs up. When you think because you know something, you can do something, this is going to buffet you. It's going to harass you in this trading floor, so to speak. But my grace is sufficient, which is a higher realm. Him who tries to operate in the law falls from the floor of grace into a lower realm. <clears throat> See, you were born from above. He tells the Galatians, why is it you have turned so quickly from the truth? Him who has begun a good work, you by faith, now you're going to turn back to the law to complete it. Paul talks, it goes all the way through Galatians, talks about the two covenants in four, and then goes to five and says, if you return to the law, you fall from grace. You come to a different realm where all this Buffeting can take place. All this harassment can take place. It all operates. Remember what Jesus says, I will hide you in my pavilion. I will set you upon my rock. I will hide you in my secret place where the enemy cannot touch you. David writes that only with your eyes shall you see the reward of the wicked. <clears throat> okay? When we operate off our knowledge base is where we get buffeted the most. Wow. Why? Is it because God's angry? No, because God will poke us enough. This is the problem. It doesn't hurt bad enough, so people stay in that realm. Wow. <clears throat> in the Amplified, it says this. Let me read this in the Amplified. It's going to get a little loud. <clears throat> True, there is nothing to be gained by it, but as I am obligated to boast, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up to the third heaven, and I know this man, whether in the body or away from the body, I do not know, God knows. words, Paul's like, hey, when I got caught up, I can't tell you if my body went with me or not. By the way, you don't know because you see yourself. You're like, you're there. But it's like, was my whole body? You can't tell. It's very hard to like come back and explain this. Jesus tells them that in John 3 that he is in heaven while he's talking to them. So you deal with that. <laughs> I read that and I go, well, okay, there's realms. <clears throat> was caught up to paradise and heard utterances beyond the power of man to put into words which is not permitted to utter. Of this same man's expressions, I will boast, but of myself personally, I wouldn't boast. Look, I will boast about the revelations, but not about the man. He's this way he's learned. See, what people mistake for is that the people given the revelation thinks that they think they're awesome. Now, some do. Most don't. Now, because we've got this thing now in the church where everyone's a rock star out of the womb. You're awesome. Like we praise, like we have taught our kids, like if they do nothing, you're awesome. Now, I believe in affirmation and all that. But I don't mind telling a kid, um, you were designed for greatness, but you really aren't doing it right now. You got the spirit of stupid 
all over you. Not, oh no, not, look it, everyone doesn't get a trophy. Everyone in the kingdom doesn't get a prize. Some don't get anything. Why? It says that their works do not stand the test of fire. Even though they get saved, all their works are burned up. See, Jesus doesn't believe on everyone getting a trophy. Jesus ain't a socialist. He is into the redistribution of wealth, which is if you're faithful, a little more will be given. If you're unfaithful, even the little you have will be taken away from you. That's stunning. He's an anti-socialist. He's not even a capitalist. Because a capitalist, it's your hard work you get to live by. Jesus is into this thing called faith and grace. He's a kingdom guy. It's all about the kingdom. <clears throat> Does it mean no worky in the kingdom? No, it doesn't mean that. doesn't mean that. It's just, do you want your efforts or do you want what he can give you? <clears throat> doesn't mean, you know, look at man who sits by side of mountain with mouth wide open waiting for roast duck to fly and goes hungry. No worky, no eaty. Okay, so we do work. We're not talking about no work. Matter of fact, Paul says everyone should work so they have something to contribute. Okay, so we're not talking about no working. We're just talking about stewarding what God gives you, and when he starts increasing you, if you know how to steward it, then he can increase you more. All right. What happens to a lot of people is they're in prayer because they're needing a breakthrough. See, look, if you only pray when you need a breakthrough, you'll never get your breakthrough for the sake of the relationship because God wants you to pray. And if the only time he's going to see you is when you're in crisis, he'll keep you in crisis so he sees you a little bit more. See, the problem with the church is we think that living in crisis is holy. We think that being in need or being in poverty, that that's actually sacrifice for the kingdom. Just try sacrificing being wealthy one time. Jesus wasn't poor, the way we think poor. People were giving, how do you think he funded his ministry? He had an entourage of men. Those boys could eat. These are fishermen. They are used to eating. They ain't eating tofu. These guys want some meat. They're not having salad. Salad. They're not having a salad luncheon. No. They have a little brisket. Okay, let me get back on this. Of this man's same experience, I will boast, but of myself personally, I will not boast, except as regards my infirmities, my weakness. Should I desire to boast, I shall not be a witless braggart, for I... <laughs> Is that interesting? I love it. It's like, it's like amplifying. <coughs> it's like smacks you in the face. Like a big hand sticking out of this thing, slapping you. <clears throat> For I shall be speaking the truth, but I abstain from it, so that no one may form a higher estimate of me than is justified by what he sees in me or hears in me. See, some people want people, you know, they want to talk about revelation because they want people to think highly of them. Now, it's okay to think highly of Paul, but he doesn't want you to think more highly than you should. In other words, what Paul wants you to realize, everything he's going to talk to us, everything he does is by grace. Here he told us he forsook everything that he formerly had for the kingdom. He didn't get, up in all his years of studying Judaism, Paul never got the revelation of Jesus. All his years of studying the scriptures, he never knew about Jesus. All the years in there, he never knew about the kingdom. So much so, he persecutes the one who comes and kills those who worship him. Because that's what his great knowledge got him, fighting God. Because that was, you know, that was the way that it's, by the way, it's what Paul writes about the Jews. They just don't want to receive righteousness from faith. They want to prove to God they can earn it. Good luck. You actually, look, there's a problem in the church that when we, we, we have a great, you know, we have a, let's say you have a really great worship team. 
that worship becomes our idol. That we boast more about how good we do something. Man, we're awesome. In that place, they really worship God well. That's, I don't want to go to a place that people brag about the worship of the people. Because the object of it is, I want to go Sunday morning to hear the band. I mean, look at this morning, the presence. I'll take that every day. And they do a great job. But we're not, we don't want to brag about our worship. That's a dangerous place to go into. Oh, like, that, well, our, like, you know what I'm saying? Boy, we worship so good this morning. Now we're, our, our admiration is about how we did something. Let me tell you, there are times where I've done everything wrong and God shows up. Just to remind me, it's not me. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I know it's not me. I've learned a lesson. My, my secret to being able to bring the presence for people is because I know he wants it, and all he wants me to do is agree. And it has nothing to do with me. He could use this chair. I'm glad he chose he uses me, but he could use anything. And I realize that it's not me. It's not my great revelation. It's not any of that. It's just he's just looking for a vessel he can use. And the problem with most people is like they're a hose no one can grab. If, look, that's just a snake. You ever, ever reach down for a hose and there's a snake in there? I, did, I think Jessie was young, but she might have been like four or five. But I reached down for the hose like this, and there was a snake in it. And I went up like a cat in all fours, went straight up in the air. It just startled me because I reached down and it moved, you know. It was before I had glasses, so I knew I was actually seeing things, you know. I went, whoa, and I jumped straight up in the air like that. Huh. There's some things if I actually had like video at the time, I'd be rich. I mean I shot and I know how cats do it. I mean I shot straight up. Like. <clears throat> and to keep me from being puffed up and too much elated by the exceeding greatness, the preeminence of these revelations, there was given to me a thorn, a splinter in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to rack and buffet and harass me. To keep me from being excessively exalted. In other words, for, to keep me from being prideful and going, I'm awesome. See, it's one thing if men praise you, just don't praise yourself. If you walk out of a, like if you, if you walk out, if, if Carrie leads worship and she walks out and goes, I'm awesome. <laughs> She's like, did you hear me this morning? So, so she sits in the car and she goes, Jeremy, I rocked it today. Now, Jeremy, don't do this because this will get you. Don't smack her. I, someone came up, someone, 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 Bill went up to someone and said, man, your worship this morning was awesome. And they said, oh, it was Jesus. He goes, no, if it was Jesus, it would have been much better. <laughs> like, just say thank you. Then you go in your prayer closet and you go, God, they actually said, my, but it's you. Do you understand? You realize it's him. You realize, you know, blind squirrels find nuts if they come down from the tree. Like, you know, you just got to learn not to boast in yourself. Other people might go, you're awesome. And then you have to go, it's you. And the messenger was given so Paul wouldn't be out there going, wow, did you see that miracle? I'm anointed. I tell you, I'm anointed. God's messenger. Woody. Three times I called upon the Lord and besought him about these things, about this, and begged that he might, it might depart from me. But he said, my grace, my favor and loving kindness and mercy is enough and sufficient and any danger enables you to bear the troubles manfully. Man up. Manfully. For my strength and power made perfect, fulfilled and completed, and show themselves most effective in your weakness. Ooh, wait a minute. Here's a revelation of Paul. Therefore, I will more gladly glory in my weakness and infirmities. 
I will acknowledge, not before men, not getting up in front of men and go, I'm nothing. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about in prayer. He's talking, don't sit there and go, like, in front of men, when you're preaching, you're not supposed to go, I'm nothing, but, you know, like, beat yourself up. People in the audience that you're preaching to will go, wow, I can really identify with him because I feel like I'm dirt too. But you don't empower anybody. You are not the object of your preaching. So in other words, if I get up here and I go, man, I really struggle with this, you go, well, that's awesome. But if I don't have the victory, all I have did is identified with your weakness, but now you're trapped in it. Because you'll actually think, but he can't get breakthrough. What hope is it for me? <laughs> or you think, or you think, if God doesn't require him to get a breakthrough, then it's okay if I live in my mess. So it's very, you're, we're supposed to represent God up here. I'm not supposed to come up here and go, oh, I'm just a man. People go, well, see, they're just being real. You're not being real. You're being really foolish. Your job is not to represent man when you're up here. Your job is to represent him. And if you have that attitude all the time, then you do your crying in the secret place and not in front of everybody in meetings. Like, I mean, how many people knew Bill was having trouble? Do you understand? I mean, their job is not to get up there and go, oh, I'm feeling weak today. It's not their job. Bill talked about when he was really having a bad morning. This is at Weaverville. He was having a bad morning, and church started at 11. And he said he didn't start until 11, 18. It took him that long to put on Christ before he could get out there. He said, I would not. He led worship. He said, I'm not. Until I get in the right frame of mind with, the, with God, I can't go out in front of the people. Because his job isn't to represent. Our job is not to re represent our humanity, but his glory. And it's really important. If you, if you realize that when you're at your job and you, you realize your job is to represent His glory everywhere, being real isn't telling people, oh, yeah, I have, I'm having a bad day, I'm just being real. That's not being real. You're, you're, now more, you're more significant than His glory. You think it's real, and people will identify. You'll attract people because misery loves company, and pigs like to spread mud on pigs. Pigs don't know pig stink. You could go and bathe an elephant, but if there's flies around, elephants like to get dirty again. They like taking dirt and throwing it on them to keep the flies away. That's not what we're supposed to do. Talking about your insufficiency to others does not keep the flies away. It attracts them. This is what keeps the flies away. Bells above. This is what keeps them away. Listen. I'm getting to the I'm getting to the I'm getting I'm getting to the punchline. I'm getting to the this is the money line right here coming up. Therefore, I will more gladly glory in my weaknesses and my infirmities that the strength and the power of Christ, the Messiah, may rest. Yes, may pitch a tent over me and dwell upon me. The word there in the Hebrew would be the hoopah tent. It's the, it's the tent of his presence that will, when you sit there and in prayer, you sit there and go, God, you're everything. By the way, God knows you're nothing without him. So it's not you getting in there and going, I'm nothing. That's, that's, no, no. It's not getting up there and telling him how worthless you are. It's just always having the mindset, I'm ev you're everything to me. You're my everything. I could do nothing apart from you, but that's only half the statement. I could do all things with you. And it's, it's resting in that. What, see, what we don't rest in prayer because we think we have to be hurt for our many words and beg God for everything we need and not knowing that he already, we're not hurt for our many words. You get in the secret place, he's there with you. And what happens is religion tricks us. We're looking for the 48-step plan to the five ways, to the seven steps to, to the glory, you know, instead of just go in, sit down, and go, here I am, Lord. I'm nothing without you. I'm everything with you. I love you. Just begin to worship him. Worship, worship him is just, just put your affections on him. Lord, I love you. I thank you for being with me. 
here I am just with you, Lord, right now. Just, just to behold you in the beauty of holiness and just to sit in your presence with you and just to let you have your way with me. I'm being fashioned and formed for your kingdom in here, Lord. And just let him do it. It's how he takes an air traffic controller boy who had enough sins and enough, enough, uh, enough history to make you all blush. And he takes him and he makes him into a preacher. I didn't want to be a preacher. I was just glad to be saved. That was it. I was just like, he saved me. And I was just so happy to be saved. I, was, I didn't pray to be a preacher. I didn't. It was never my prayer. Oh, God, make me a preacher. Never. God, make me a preacher. Never was my prayer. You know, my prayer was, oh, God, just, I love you. That was it. I didn't have, I don't have all the great prayers. I, I don't have them written down. The great revelation prayers that we're all supposed to pray. It was real simple. I love you. Here I am. And I'd spend time with him. I'd read his word. I'd get stuck somewhere on his word and I'd meditate on it until he was done. There's a scripture in, in Kings. I got stuck on one night in a hotel room for 45 minutes. I was um, serving down there with Randy and was staying in a room with another person and he said, hey, I just pulled my Bible out. And he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just reading. I'm going through the book of Kings right now. And he goes, really? He says, what do you, what, read to me. I said, okay, I'll read to you. And I got to this verse. I got stuck. We got stuck there for 45 minutes. Didn't move. And it was this. First Kings 6, 7. And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone, finished at the quarry, so that no hammer or chisel or iron tool was heard in the temple when it was being built. In other words, see, most people think you're supposed to be built here. And and I knew that we're to be fashioned in the quarry, in our living room, in our private place, when God's hewing out and chiseling away. He is the great Michael Angelo of the kingdom. He can take a rock. And when he looks at you and he looks at all its rough edges, he goes, I see something glorious in there. And as you spend time in his presence, he brings his hammer and his tool and his chisel, and he begins to bang away and chip away and smooth out the corners and begins to fashion you. It's not about preaching. It's just about being who you were created to be. Everyone's a preacher. Not everyone's in the pulpit, but everyone's a preacher. Everyone has a ministry. You didn't realize this, but when you got born again, you entered full-time ministry. It says, him who preaches the gospel will live by it doesn't mean you'll take up offerings. It says that him, whatever, when you spend your time in the secret place, God rewards you openly. He doesn't always answer your prayers in the secret place. Sometimes you don't, get, you don't know you got an answer until you get outside the door. It depends what you're praying for. But you have to believe this. You have to believe when you prayed that he heard you. And then since he heard you, you have the petitions you've asked of him. Doesn't mean that's a faith stance. It's not of, oh yes, he sent down a scroll with an angel. He stood over you. The Father has heard your prayer. I mean, that happened one time with Cornelius, but let's not make that the standard way God answers our prayers. I mean, what he's asking Cornelius to do is a little different than you just want to get along better with your mother. He's about to shift something from the Jews to the Gentiles. This is a pretty big deal. By the way, it had already gone to the Gentiles before that. Do you understand that Romans had gotten saved? <laughs> the Jews just weren't preaching to him yet. Jesus did. <laughs> Jesus prayed for Romans. He prayed for people outside of Israel. The Greeks came to see him. The one who was lowered by in the couch was a Roman senator, and Jesus healed him. Jesus, what do you think they were ticked off at him? I mean, he was doing, he told them, he told the Jews simply, my father's taking the kingdom from you. 
And he's giving it to another nation who will bear fruit of it. And he took the kingdom away from Israel. We're now his kingdom. We're now his nation. It's just, it's just, it's really simple, but we've made it harder. And because it's so simple, we get distracted. You know how you get, you get distracted in simple things? Like the harder it is, the more you focus. The, 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 the point is you're going to have to learn how to focus in the, simple, in the simple things. How many people have ever been bitten by an elephant? Anyone ever get bitten by a mosquito? It's the little things that get you. And if you pay attention to the little things in the kingdom, they live the big things. But the problem is, is we, we only want to focus on the big stuff. Instead of the simplicity which is Christ. And if I lead you in any other way than the simplicity, then I preached another gospel to you. He said, I will dwell with them and in them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if you go into the secret place and you realize everything in your life requires grace, not just the things you think you can't handle, because the only way you're handling the other stuff is grace too. So what Brian, Brian, watch the video from Brian. Please do. I mean, really, really, or listen to the podcast. Because Brian just came to a revelation that Chris Valton had to come to, that Bill had come to, Heidi come to, I've come to, that everyone I know comes to. And if they don't come to it, then they have big crashes in their life. Because God is leading us all out of our comfort zone. Because nothing happens in the comfort zone that's worthwhile. Because it doesn't require His grace. Hmm. See, so anything that's done without grace really is in His kingdom. So you can pray for the sick, but you can't heal the sick. If you think your prayers healed somebody, they don't. It's him that heals them. The sooner you realize that your prayer is just a conduit, but not the power, it would be like the copper wire thinking it's electricity. Knowing that a copper wire is just copper wire unless something's flowing through it. It is in itself, it has no purpose. It only has purpose when it's connected to something. In yourself, you have no purpose. You only have your purpose in Christ. Or whatever else you decide to connect. Some people connect themselves to other things, darkness, and that's their purpose. But when you connect yourself to Christ, is when you find your purpose. You were meant to be a conduit. You were meant to be that, that vessel that God flows through and brings healing and brings power and brings, and brings deliverance. You do not bring deliverance. He does. You are just a conduit. And yet, he lets you receive praise and honor and glory as if you did it. And that's where you go back in the prayer closet and goes, I did nothing. You don't act in front of the people like you did it. You just say, thank you. Thank you. Not, it was Jesus. We know it was Jesus. We're pretty sure of it. And well, most people are. I guess some people aren't, right? You know, some people think that person's the healer. I, I, you might have to correct some of those things. But let's just say most people are mature enough to know that the person who prayed for me didn't actually heal me. But does that mean that God, I mean, why does God use some people and not others? Because some people are spending time in the secret place. How many want to be used of God? How many of you want to just be more like God? How was I that one? That's probably a better answer. <clears throat> Step one, realize you're nothing apart from him. You're, you know, to act like we were something without him is not really, you know, well, we were always, God, we were always great. No, 
No. Well, in the garden they were great. Yeah, but they were in the garden. They were in him. They were with him. They became a problem after they sinned. <laughs> you know. It says man is nothing but a vapor. But now, connected with God, we're glorious. I mean, to think we were something so great before. I mean, we, we, we were in some regards, but in most regards, it's like Paul says, what remained is so much better than what was. Man can do a lot of things. He is a created, created being who can create stuff. But, man, with Christ, we're, we've got our purpose. We've got our, we understand what we're connected to. And all we are is zapping people. You know, like when you just reach out to people and you just be that conduit, then, then God just flows through you. And he, he's, he's not a respecter of people. What happens to people when they pray is like they think that they have to push it out. You know, like it's in me. I gotta, if I say the right prayer. Look, it, if you look like you're constipated, you're probably not in rest. <laughs> if you're doing this when you pray, sorry, nothing comes out when you do that. You got to rest to manifest. All right, let's pray. Let's come to that. Let's come to prayer. Father, I, I thank you for the revelation of who you are, the revelation of who we are in you, the revelation of your secret place, the revelation of just coming in simply with you, spending time with you, your son, your spirit, that your strength might be infused in us. That we might live by the grace of God, the power of God that enables us and strengthens us for every situation, helps us to live high upon a rock, seated with Christ in heavenly places, where Satan is under our feet, and all darkness, and all thrones, and all principalities and powers are underneath the seat of Christ. I thank you for it. You have made us more than conquerors, more than victorious, more than whole and healthy. We are all things to all people in all times of need. We are not the answer, but we carry the answer. We carry the presence. We carry the passion and love of Christ to people. We thank you for it. You enable us. You strengthen us. You bless our homes, our businesses, our ministries. You bless our children, our parents. You bless our relationships. You bless everything of the kingdom. We thank you for it. We seek the king and the kingdom first in all things. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. For all belongs to you. All is of you. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well.